Today we have a brand new episode in our series, True Crimes Bible Edition. Today's episode is somewhat unique. We're going to investigate two separate crimes committed 30 years apart. One was a mass murder, the other was the murder of a single individual. The Bible is incredibly interconnected with threads that run through it from beginning to end. In this podcast, I will uncover these threads, help you dig deeper into God's truth, and inspire you to live your life with greater confidence and joy. Welcome to Bible Threads with me, Dr. Bruce Becker. But these two crimes, separated by three decades, have some things in common. The first crime was committed by a man named Herod. The second crime was committed by a man named Herod. But they weren't the same Herod. They were father and son. The father was Herod I, also known as Herod the Great. The son was Herod Antipas. The murders they committed reveal some similarities as to the thinking and motivation of both of the Herods. Both of them had a lust for power, and it should come as no surprise that the desire for power is a powerful human emotion and can lead people to take drastic action, either to acquire power in the first place or to keep their hold on it. These two Herods show up on the pages of the Bible. But before we get to their stories from the Bible, it would be helpful to learn more about them, and here's why. Who they were and how they came to their thrones reveals the source of their power, how fragile that power was, and why they took such drastic steps to hold on to it. Much of what we know about the Herods is from the historians Josephus and, to a lesser degree, this the historian Appian. Now, for those of you who aren't history nerds, hang in there with me. I think you'll appreciate the historical context for what the Bible tells us about these two Herods. Let's start with a trivia question. What was the ethnic and nationality background of Herod the Great and his successors? Now, it would be perfectly reasonable to assume that, because Herod was a king ruling on behalf of the Roman Empire, that he was a Roman. Good guess, but no cigar. Herod's parents were actually from the country of Edom, which was a border nation located to the southeast of Judea. Ethnically, Herod's parents were Arabs, or Nabataeans, as some scholars suggest. Nabataeans were a Bedouin tribe that roamed the Arabian Peninsula. But get this. Somewhere in Herod's family history, his ancestors converted to Judaism. So, Herod was raised a Jew, and he considered himself a Jew. Now, that makes a lot of sense from a Roman Empire perspective. Who better to be king over the Jews than someone who himself was a Jew. Herod the Great was born around 72 BC. His father was a high-ranking government official who had a good relationship with Julius Caesar, the Roman general who led the Roman army, armies in the Gallic Wars and who defeated his arch-rival Pompey in a civil war. As a result, Julius Caesar became a dictator in 49 BC and ruled five years until he was assassinated in 44 BC. Kings and dictators faced the chronic threat of an assassination attempt by a rival who was seeking his own power. Julius Caesar, before his death, had entrusted Herod's father with overseeing all of the public affairs in Judea. A couple of years later, Herod himself was appointed to be the governor of the province of Galilee up in the north. Herod would have been about 25 years old at the time. Herod's ascent to a governorship was an example of not what you know, but who you know. Then in 41 BC, the Roman ruler Mark Antony, 
Yes, the Mark Antony of Antony and Cleopatra fame. And if you don't know that story, you can read about it. Or watch Charlton Heston's 1972 movie entitled Antony and Cleopatra. Anyway, Mark Antony appointed Herod as a tetrarch to support Rome's appointed ruler in Judea. The ruler's name was Hyrcanus II. He ruled from Jerusalem. When Hyrcanus was overthrown by his very own nephew, Antigonus, Herod went to Rome to advocate that the Roman leaders restore Hyrcanus to power. But they didn't. But then, in a surprising move, the Roman Senate in 37 BC appointed Herod to be the king of the Jews. Now, not a religious title, but a political one. Herod left Rome and returned to Judea and, after a three-year war, defeated Antigonus and secured for himself kingship over Jerusalem and all Judea. He would rule Judea as a subordinate client state of the Roman Empire until his death right around the time that Jesus was born. As I mentioned before, Herod I was also known as Herod the Great. Well, what made him great? One of the key contributing factors to his title were his massive building projects that he planned and completed all across Judea. A couple of them were for the benefit of the Jewish people, others for his own personal prestige and even safety. Around 19 BC, he began an expansion project on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. Not only did he rebuild and enlarge the Jewish temple, he expanded the earthen platform on which the temple stood, so that the platform was twice the size of the original. If you go to Jerusalem and visit the Western Wall, you'll witness evidence of Herod's building project. The Western Wall was part of the perimeter wall of the expanded platform that Herod had constructed. By the way, this was Herod's most ambitious building project. Another of Herod's building projects was at the Cave of the Patriarchs in Hebron. The Patriarch Abraham had originally purchased the land that had this cave in it. Abraham wanted to bury his wife Sarah there. Then when Abraham died, Isaac and Ishmael buried him there as well. Isaac? Isaac's wife Rebekah, Esau, and Jacob were all buried there too. So it was named the Cave of the Patriarchs. For the Jewish people, this was a sacred site. Now, the building project that Herod commissioned was to build a large rectangular enclosure over the cave to commemorate the site for the Jewish people. Here's a fun fact. The stone walls of this structure were six feet thick. The coastal city of Caesarea was home to four different building projects commissioned by Herod. First, there was Herod's harbor. He built a 40-acre harbor that would accommodate 300 ships of the day. In Caesarea, he also constructed an outdoor theater with a seating capacity of 3,500. And of course, King Herod needed a royal palace, needing one that overlooked the Mediterranean Sea. It was called the Promontory Palace because it was built on a promontory jutting out into the sea. What was really unique in this palace was a very large swimming pool filled with fresh water. But to get the fresh water, Herod also built an aqueduct from springs located at the base of Mount Carmel, about 10 miles away. In order to have gravity move the water, the aqueduct was built on arches, and was constructed with a precise gradient so the water would flow at just the right rate. We also can't forget to mention the five fortresses that Herod built, fortresses for himself and his family in the event of an insurrection. The most well-known of these fortresses is Masada. Today, Masada is the most popular tourist site in all of Israel. All of these building projects contributed to Herod being called Herod the Great. But he did more than that. Herod also provided for the people living in Judea during difficult times, especially during famines. 
Herod, for the most part, was a king that cared for the people of Judea. But he did things that upset the Jewish people, especially the religious leaders. All of the, his building projects, as, as great as they were, required capital to fund them, and much of it came in the form of taxes. Hack, uh, Herod's taxes were despised, as were the tax collectors who collected them. Note Matthew. When the temple was being rebuilt, Herod ignored the demands of the Jewish religious leaders regarding the construction of the temple. He also replaced the local religious leaders with priests from Babylon and Egypt in order to win the favor of Jews living in these foreign countries. Despite the good that Herod did, there was a strong national sentiment to overthrow Rome's control. The Jewish people were looking for a savior from Roman rule. What's even worse is that Herod had a really dark side. Herod was chronically paranoid. He was always concerned that someone was coming to take him out, to assassinate him. Maybe that's why he thought he needed five fortresses. Some of his concerns were justified. It was not uncommon for kings to be assassinated by a rival to the throne. But Herod's concern for his own safety went to the extreme. During his reign, he had several high-ranking officials put to death because he sensed they were a threat to his throne. He had several members of his own family executed, including one of his ten wives, along with her son and her mother, who was actually seeking to unseat him. He had a brother-in-law put to death and even two of his own sons, Alexander and Aristobulus. To protect himself, Herod had a personal bodyguard. Would you believe his bodyguard consisted of 2,000 soldiers? Herod also had a secret police to monitor and investigate what the people were saying about him. Herod the Great or Herod the Paranoid? Well, that's a little bit about Herod the Greats, the good, the bad, and now let's get to the ugly, which we read about in Matthew chapter 2. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all of the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem and Judea they replied. Nearly 40 years earlier, the Roman Senate declared Herod to be the king of the Jews. And now some dudes from out east come looking for one who has been born king of the Jews? So it isn't a surprise that Herod was disturbed. His paranoia kicked into high gear. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. The Magi left and headed to Bethlehem, where they found Mary and Joseph and the baby Jesus. They worshipped him and presented their gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Then in a dream, the Magi were warned not to return to Herod and to head home a different way. Then in another dream, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph and told him to flee to Egypt because Herod was going to search for Jesus to kill him. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious, and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity, who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Herod's paranoia drove him to become a baby killer. This tragic event has been called the slaughter of the innocents. Herod the Great? Herod the Paranoid? How about Herod the Murderer? Fear and paranoia are strong human emotions. They can lead us to do drastic things, irrational things, destructive things. 
we would do well to recognize our own fears and paranoia and control them so they don't control us. When Herod the Great died, the Romans divided his kingdom among three of his sons and his sister. Archelaus became ethnarch of Judea, Samaria, and Idumea. Herod Antipas became ruler of Galilee and Perea. Philip became ruler of territories north and east of the Jordan, which today is called the Golan Heights. And Salome was given what's called a toparchy, a small district that had several cities. This succession plan was divided by Herod the Great, but had to be ratified by Caesar Augustus, also known as Octavian, who ruled as the first Roman emperor from 27 BC to 14 AD. Caesar Augustus, for the most part, approved Herod's succession plan. Let's meet Herod Antipas. Herod Antipas was born about 20 years before Jesus was born. He is referred to both in history books and the Bible as Herod the Tetrarch. He never did officially have the title of king. The two regions that Herod Antipas ruled were Galilee in the north and Perea, which was on the eastern side of the Jordan River. The two regions were separated by a piece of real estate known as the Decapolis. The Decapolis was a region comprised of ten cities nine of which were on the east side of the Jordan, with one city on the west. The area around the city on the west side is what separated Galilee from Perea. After Herod the Great died, which created a short-term leadership vacuum, there were multiple revolts. One took place at a palace of Sepphoris in Galilee. Herod Antipas was in Rome when this occurred. The historian Josephus wrote that a Jewish zealot by the name of Judas, son of Hezekiah, attacked Sephorus, plundered the city, taking money and weapons, which were then used to terrorize the region. As a result, the Roman governor in Syria responded to this revolt by burning the city and selling its inhabitants into slavery. When Herod Antipas assumed his reign as tetrarch, he followed in his father's footsteps. He rebuilt and fortified the city of Sephoris. He also fortified the city of Betharamtha in Perea. But Herod and Antipas's greatest construction project was building his capital city of Tiberias on the western shores of the Sea of Galilee. One of the features of the city was the nearby access to 17 mineral hot springs. He also built a stadium, a palace, and a sanctuary for Jewish prayer. Tiberias became the largest city and one of the most important cities in all of Galilee. It's mentioned in John chapter 6 as the location from which boats sailed to the eastern shore of the Sea of Galilee after Jesus' miraculous feeding of the 5,000. In Matthew chapter 14, we read about Herod Antipas's previous interaction with John the Baptist. It's a section that recaps what happened to John the Baptist at the hands of Herod. Let's hear what Matthew has to tell us. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard the reports about Jesus, and he said to his attendants, This is John the Baptist. He has risen from the dead. That is why miraculous powers are at work in him. Three points. First, John the Baptist was already dead. Second, Herod learned about Jesus and his miraculous powers and acknowledged Jesus' ability to perform miracles. And third, Herod must have had a guilty conscience because he assumed that Jesus was really John the Baptist back from the dead in order to haunt him. Back to the account in Matthew. Now Herod had arrested John and bound him and put him in prison because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. Let's just pause here for a moment. So what's the backstory of Herod and Herodias? Well, the relationship between Herod Antipas and Herodias is a bit complicated, but I'll do my best to uncomplicate it. 
Early in his reign, Herod Antipas was married to the daughter of Aretas, the king of Nabataea. Now, recall that the Nabataeans were a nomad tribe living in the desert of Arabia. The daughter's name was Phasilus. However, on a trip to Rome, Herod Antipas stayed with his half-brother Philip. Now, same father, different mothers. And remember, Philip was the ruler of what today is the Golan Heights. While in Rome, Herod Antipas fell in love with Philip's wife, Herodias. Keep in mind that Philip and Herodias had a daughter named Salome. More on her in a bit. Now, Herodias was the granddaughter of Herod the Great. So, Philip wasn't only her husband, he was also her uncle, Uncle Phil. That also meant that Herod Antipas was Herodias' half-uncle. What a tangled web we weave. While Herod Antipas and Herodias ran off together and headed back to Galilee, they agreed to get married as soon as Herod divorced his wife, Phasilus. Now, Phasilus finagled a way to return to her father, King Eratos. And once she was under the safety of her father, King Eratos, he waged war against Herod Antipas, a war that Herod would eventually lose, to be followed by a charge of treason by one of his own nephews. Amazing. Back to Matthew's account. Now Herod had arrested John and bound him and put him in prison because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. For John had been saying to him, It is not lawful for you to have her. Herod wanted to kill John, but he was afraid of the people because they considered John a prophet. John the Baptist had publicly criticized Herod Antipas for taking his brother's wife to be his own. So, to shut John up, Herod had John thrown into prison. Historians indicate that this was at one of the palace fortresses that Herod the Great had built. It was the Machiris Fortress on the eastern bank of the Dead Sea. Again, back to Matthew's account. On Herod's birthday, the daughter of Herodias, now this, this would be Salome, danced for the guests and pleased Herod so much that he promised with an oath to give her whatever she asked. Prompted by her mother, she said, Give me here on a platter the head of John the Baptist. The king was distressed. But because of his oaths and his dinner guests, he ordered that her request be granted and had John beheaded in the prison. His head was brought in on a platter and given to the girl, who carried it to her mother. John's disciples came and took his body and buried it. Then they went and told Jesus. There is so much wrong with what Herod Antipas, Herodias, and Salome did. Herod's recklessness, foolishness, and unwillingness to do what was right, just to save face with his guests, cost John the Baptist his life. Like his father, Herod Antipas was a murderer. But that's not the end of the story about Herod Antipas. During Jesus' final ministry in Galilee, a group of Pharisees warned Jesus that Herod was plotting his death. Do you recall Jesus' response? He replied, Go tell that fox, I will keep on driving out demons and healing people today and tomorrow, and on the third day I will reach my goal. In any case, I must press on today and tomorrow and the next day, for surely no prophet can die outside Jerusalem. Jesus was headed to Jerusalem, where he was betrayed, arrested, and brought before Pontius Pilate for trial. Jesus was brought before Pilate because he was the governor of Roman Judea, which included Jerusalem, where Jesus had been arrested. But because Jesus had been so active in Galilee, and the fact that Herod Antipas was in Jerusalem that week, Pilate sent him to Herod. Herod wanted to see Jesus perform a miracle, but Jesus did not oblige him. So Herod sent Jesus back to Pilate's court, having found nothing deserving of death. 
That's the last time we hear of Herod Antipas in the New Testament. Mark Twain once said, All kings is mostly rapscallions. All kings is mostly rapscallions. A rapscallion is a person who causes trouble. That was certainly the case of the two Herods. And there's a lesson for us here. Only when we submit our lives to the King of Kings and trust in His Son for forgiveness can any of us escape being a rapscallion. True Crimes, Bible Edition. In our, our next and final episode of this series, we'll investigate a crime committed by a man who was considered by Jesus' followers to be enemy number one. Please join me. And if you have any thoughts or questions about this podcast, please email me at bruce at timeofgrace.org. I'd, I'd love to hear from you. Did you know, I think you probably do, that Time of Grace has seven different podcasts, each designed with different audiences in mind? And did you know that the number of people listening to one of our podcasts continues to increase in number? Every month, there are more than 100,000 downloads of the Time of Grace podcast. What a blessing. Be sure to tell your friends and relatives about this great way for them to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks for listening, and God bless.